Welcome to Conversations with Dr. Skip Mason. Pastor, preacher, historian, author, teacher, librarian, archivist, world traveler, collector, family historian, avid reader, and creator of the popular Vanishing Black Atlanta Facebook page. But a lot of folks who love history. Most Most importantly, importantly, he's our dad dad, who loves his family and who taught us the importance of our history and having important conversations. Join him now for this episode of Conversations with Dr. Skip. Well, good Sunday afternoon, my brothers and sisters, or whatever you're watching uh, this conversation. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I am so glad Uh, to spend a little time with you uh, on this afternoon to share a couple of important conversations. Uh, The first one, an opportunity uh, to sit with Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton uh, and to hear about her process for creating the Episcopal address that many of us heard uh, during the general conference. Uh, And I think you're going to be in for a treat. And also to sit with Bishop Kenneth Wayne Carter Uh, and some of the preachers of Jackson, Mississippi, to get an update uh, on the water crisis there. But let me extend my greetings to our distinguished uh, College of Bishops and uh, their spouses, uh, and to all of you, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, who are watching uh, now. Uh, I am coming on once a month uh, at this time, and I want to make this a meaningful uh, conversation and time uh, well spent couple of announcements before uh, we begin. Uh, Please be reminded that this evening at 7 o'clock p.m., there will be a wonderful and a very informative uh, CIT Tech Talk, uh, of course, hosted by Dr. Teresa Duhard, our General Secretary of Communication, Information, and Technology. Uh, And she has a wonderful panel of, of guests, including Senior Bishop Lawrence Reddick, Bishop James B. Walker, Bishop Sylvester Williams, Sr., Mr. Philip Hill, Pastor Reverend Courtney Adams, and Mrs. Tanisha Hollingshed. Uh, And so they're going to be talking about cybersecurity and best practices to understand the risk and to protect yourself and the church. And you will not want to miss that at seven. Also, a little birdie told me that they are going to officially unveil the new CME Church website. Now, I can only give you three seconds of it. You'll have to tune in at 7 o'clock p.m. uh, for the CIT Tech Talk to see the rest of it. It is magnificent, uh, and Dr. Duhard and her wonderful team have worked hard to create a, a really updated uh, website that is going to be engaging uh, and feature uh, the technological savvy of herself and her team. So I am truly excited about that as well. We lost a, a couple of giants uh, recently in our church. Of course, the Reverend Joseph uh, C. Neal, the former you know, Secretary of Finance, uh, and the Reverend uh, Dr. Raymond Williams. Uh, and so we pause to remember and to reflect Uh, on their lives and the great contributions that they gave. But I am excited and I want to get right into it uh, to share with you the conversation uh, that I had with uh, Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton uh, while she was in Dallas uh, attending the College of Bishops meeting. Uh, And so please sit back and enjoy and don't leave because we'll get an update uh, on the water crisis. And so many of you across the country uh, sent your funds and uh, drove trucks to deliver water uh, to help our brothers and sisters there and our CME churches. So I'm excited uh, also to share that with you. A delight to welcome uh, back again uh, the 59th Bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church and our ecumenical Bishop, Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton who comes to me early this morning. When you see it, of course, it'll be in the afternoon. But Bishop Jefferson Snowden, good morning and good afternoon. (laughs) Good to see you, Dr. Skip. Thank you so much. It's always a delight to see you. And thank you for spending a little time with me today. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, see how you and 
and uh, Elder Lawrence are doing and your your new adjustment and relocation and how is all of that going for you all? Oh my goodness, I would not, uh, I hope I don't have to do this again. Uh, moving, <laughs> packing up everything that you've had in the Episcopal residence for uh, almost 12 years, yeah. <laughs> books and programs and papers and you know, all kinds of memorabilia. It was difficult not to get sidetracked by every piece you pick up going, oh yeah, I remember. Right. Uh, it was like stay focused. Yeah, a lot of memories, lots of memories. Got to get this done. Yeah, found our yeah. home and moved and relocated, so we're we're doing good. Well, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And I think now you are currently with the College of Bishops. You all are uh, in your fall meeting. That's correct. Uh huh. We are currently meeting in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. You all like to meet, don't you? We have to meet. Have to meet. There's, right. there's much there's much business to take care of, and uh, it always seems like there's never enough time to get it all done. But, yeah. Uh, I don't know about that like to meet part, but uh, it's part of the calling. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. And, and speaking of part of the calling, um, this past summer at the General Conference, for the first time in the history of our beloved church, uh, you as the first female bishop of our church gave the ecumenical uh, address. Uh, and that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, we want to kind of dig deep uh, and to find out from you that process of putting uh, that historic, and, and not only was it historic, it, it was profound. Uh, it, was, um, it was what we needed to hear. Uh, and as you said uh, at the beginning that you were going to deliver every single word, <laughs> paraphrasing, of course, uh, that you uh, poured your heart and soul out. But before we, we do that, let me just play a small clip. This task and what might be a relevant and prophetic word for the CME Church in 2022. These two verses capture the essence of what lies before us. Because no matter what is happening around us, no matter the challenges or changes that we face, it is crucial for the church and for our church to continue to proclaim the salvific word of God. Then let us make our boast of his redeeming power. And we must never abandon or shortchange the call or the mandate to take up the cross so that no matter what we may lose in this life, we may Jesus gain. With that in mind, I'm offering this call and proposed theme to the Connectional Church in its 151st year and in this 40th General Conference. The call is to be bold. Be bold. Face now. Embrace next. See new. Be bold, face now, embrace next, and see you. And you issued the call, and what a call it was. Bishop, if you would, tell us how did you get to, to that theme, and, and just kind of walk us, if you will, through the moments in preparation uh, and, and putting that Episcopal uh, address together. Well, um, it all started, I, can't, I guess it was shortly after the general conference in like the second year after uh, the general conference, uh, the College of Bishops decide who's going to deliver the address. And typically it's the senior of the class that was just elected, the first person elected you know, in the, in the new class of bishops. Well, if you recall in 2018, we did not have any election of bishops. So, you know, it was kind of a unique situation and the college um, decided, <laughs> dialogue and decided that this would be an opportunity to uh, add to the historic nature of our church by uh, assigning that task of the Episcopal address to the first woman bishop 
and that happened to be me. So that was that probably was in maybe the latter part of 2019. Could have been in the summer, like at the retreat in 2019. And you know, it was far enough in advance where it just sounded like a great opportunity. Like, oh wow, I get to do that. <laughs> and um, you know, I had, of, of course, um, in my first quadrennium had watched Bishop Walker as he prepared for the address and dialogue with the college and had done the same with Bishop Best when he delivered the address in 2018. But I just was not prepared for the depth of, um, uh, in for the intensity of that task uh, initially. I uh, just didn't grasp it until uh, it was time to start I don't want to say it didn't, the gravity of the task began to hit me in two ways. Once it was getting closer, it's like, oh, what am I going to say? But remember, shortly after I got the assignment, the pandemic came. That's right. In 2020. And so every time I tried to think through what I might say uh, to the church on behalf of the bishops in the address, life around us changed yeah and i certainly wanted to give a message that was relevant to the moment and the moment kept changing <laughs> and <laughs> that was that was the biggest biggest challenge that i had but somewhere along the way the whole notion of boldness really just got in my spirit uh, and that part of my thinking it just would not let me go i really attribute that to to the urging of the spirit that that the church was really in a season where it had to embrace its own power mm -hmm. and see itself as as having impact and so that be bold part just what i wrestled with it being bold boldly boldness <laughs> and there were several iterations of the of the theme uh which actually uh the theme as it was announced was only finalized like the week before i sent it to uh dr lewis for publication really uh -huh. now it was you know i had being bold seeing new um facing now embracing you know the ing the action right. uh but the whole declarative be bold came fairly late <laughs> in the process but when it came it was like yes this is what i'm trying to say so i went back through the the draft at that point which was probably like the fourth draft and changed all the ing's <laughs> to uh, the declarative face now as opposed right. to facing now um and so the, it, the pandemic um really kind of prompted so many things that you included in the the address mm -hmm. i mean it really shifted our church mm -hmm. and you as an episcopal leader uh you were interrupted as you said because you had to make sure that your churches were functioning as mm -hmm. best as they could, mm -hmm. given the uh, challenges of the, the pandemic, but it really became the core foundation, mm -hmm. you know, of propelling us um, into the future um, from, from what we heard from you and, and what we read in the, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the address. Mm -hmm. it just makes you wonder if the pandemic hadn't come, what direction you might have, you know, well, I'm not, I, 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 you know, that's a question I can't answer, but answer, right. you, you know, the, the bishop structure it so that the um, outline is presented like a year ahead of time. Okay. And then there's a first draft that the bishops look at in uh, the, in our winter meeting before the spring, before the general conference, and then another draft that's looked at uh, in our May meeting in our spring retreat, just for the general conference. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of the pandemic, I think what the pandemic did for me in terms of thinking about what does bold mean is that you, know, you really can't be bold unless you have a sense of purpose mm -hmm. and awareness and a sense of function. And what the pandemic did was it altered our reality. Yes, it did. 
And as people were kind of wrestling with that, I think what I was what I was seeing and tapping into was this deep desire for things to go back to normal. And um, so that first bullet about uh, face now had to do with the fact of saying to the church, it's not normal anymore. <laughs> and we got to face up to the reality of the shift. And um, I, I saw this as an opportunity, not just to talk about that shift, but to talk about the way in which we tend to uh, glamorize uh, and get nostalgic about the good old days. And, and we don't, and we kind of, and we can gloss over what's happening right now. We can, we can just, you know, kind of tell the best story as opposed to facing up to some of the hard truths. And I wrestled with that part of the address because, you know, I kind of gave a, a 10 affirmations of what we do well. And then there were 10 uh, things about, you know, we need to just, just tell ourselves the truth about some of the things that we do and we just kind of accept them, but they're not very helpful to us in terms of, uh, you know, how we don't often own up to our limitations. Right. We often don't, we want to bury our heads in the sand about our membership and how it's shifting. Uh, sometimes even, you know, in reporting things, we you know, inflate numbers to make ourselves look good or feel better. And right. I, I really felt like if we're going to be bold, we have to face those things, those things that give us uh, the strength that we need, you know, those things are our historic faith, mm -hmm. um, this this really sense of connection. I, I wanted to highlight that because, you know, I think during the pandemic, we saw the church in some ways at its best. Uh, we got connected. We found new ways to connect. Uh, and it was not just connecting with our typical audience, but through like the show that you began uh, around the history of the, I mean, that became the event of the week <laughs> in the church, everybody. And it, and it was only supposed to be one show. Yeah, but that became the buzz. Everybody, wow. you're going to watch Skip Show, you're going to watch so-and-so and so is on this afternoon. And it was a way in which the church found a way to stay connected sure. and to, to talk about who we are together uh, where we've been, what have our what our journey's been. So I thank you for doing that because I think it was just a, a key part of, of the church at its best. And you know the ways in which our church rallied to give people food uh -huh. and um, responded to the crises that happened, uh, the tornadoes and things that happened in various places during that time period. So we we have to own that and we have to be proud of it. We, we don't need to be in a posture of just always denigrating our church. Of course. And, and, finding, know, all of the uh, and, find, and finding all the negatives. But yes. when there are negatives, we have to embrace them and say, what do they mean? That's right. And, and how is God calling us to be more and to, yeah. to move beyond that? So that first part of uh, facing now was really important to lay the foundation. Well, I like that you um, included uh, in your... I think in your introduction, you talked about your conversation partners. I think that's how you referred to yes. them. Mm -hmm. and, and many of them were some of your local preachers mm -hmm. uh, when you were presiding over the 5th Episcopal District. I, I like that uh, because you, it, what it said to us is that you, you had your ear uh, to the ground in terms of what local preachers were thinking, doing, and how they were, were responding. And as you call the names of uh, Marquise and Greg and Kenan, I saw all their chests just stick <laughs> out and, and, and Kathy, all of these are reverends of uh, Zach and uh, Geraldine and Van Carl and, and now Bishop Haynes. I mean, I thought that was wonderful mm -hmm. that you included that and so I, I want to, to talk about the engagement process, if you will. How often did you engage them and others, you mm -hmm. know, in helping to uh provide with you, you know, some some food to go into this uh this magnificent address? Well, <clears throat> people probably won't believe it, but that was a very intimidating process initially. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm going to put myself out there you right. know, in, in advance and ask these folks, what do you think? 
Uh, but you know, kind of once I got beyond that, it pretty much started with me sending them just an outline. You okay. know, here here are the main points that I'm thinking uh, and the main direction that I'm going. And it was not in the same format that we ended up with because obviously their comments and feedback meant a whole lot and really did help me reshape uh, reshape that that outline. So uh, they most of them sent responses to the outline in terms of be sure to include this uh have you thought about this uh and then as there were, a draft was developed different people did different parts uh everybody saw the outline some saw the first draft some only saw the second draft or the next to the last draft but you know some sent responses going well here's a great resource uh here's a book you could consider uh, others hear scripture. Another person said, you know, I've been mulling over this myself in my ministry. And here's what I think, and particularly some of the commentary on bold and what what that might mean uh, in the church. So it, it was a it was a very I, I wish I had done a little bit more of that um, earlier when I was really wrestling, but it was a very uh, productive process. And I'm just grateful for those individuals who were open and honest uh, and, and willing to critique a bishop. You know, that's not. <laughs> that's not an easy task, folks. It's not an easy task to say, you know, you need to think about this and what about this? And, right. and even uh, the title, like I said, the title came later because I had a title and, you know, one, one uh, said, well, you know, maybe it should be this instead. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was, it, it was very helpful. And I think, uh, the voice of the people who are really, um, I, I don't want to say in the trenches, because the church is definitely not the trenches, but really who are our uh, hands and feet on the ground. Right. Uh, where where the worshiping community lives. I, I think their voices and uh, the echoes of their experience was really important in making it uh, a relevant conversation through the address. Did you have a chance? I know you you referenced Bishop Walker's and Bishop Best uh, ecumenical address that you you listened to and you were a part of. But did you have a chance to read any of the previous um, uh, ecumenical addresses? Uh, I mean, each one of them in their own, I think, are, are major pieces of work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a copy of the one that Bishop William Yancey Bell did. And, and, and after I finished it, I said, my God, he should get the Pulitzer Prize for this. It is just amazing the level of scholarship and intellect mm -hmm, that, that mm -hmm. goes into this. You know, but did you get a chance? Uh, is there a collection somewhere that I can't <laughs> seem to put my hand on or find? I don't know. I don't know whether there's a collection. Uh, other than a senior bishop read its library. Yeah, of course. yeah. Right. I did. I did uh, peruse some addresses, but mm -hmm. not many. The major work that I read was um, the autobiography of Bishop Hosey. Oh yes, and uh, because I really wanted to get a sense of what the early church was wrestling with and not just the church, but the people mm -hmm. that helped form the church. And I actually stumbled across uh, an electronic version of his autobiography and just got totally absorbed in uh, not only his life story, but the way in which uh, his, his engagement with the church challenges, because I saw the church in a moment of challenge. Yes. Uh, and, and certainly, while different, it did echo, you know, the, the major challenge of actually starting a denomination. And his autobiography was one of the more complete ones that I was able to put my hands on. And uh, it it really convicted me because um, my life as a bishop is just so much more glamorous. It's not glamorous. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. Right. But in terms of, um, you know, having very few resources and and really struggling to even feed his family yeah. uh, while he was serving the church as bishop just gave me a sense, uh, gave me a different perspective on um, how God has blessed the church and even how God had blessed me. 
-hmm. And for me, that was empowering. That was reading about his boldness and uh, particularly the story, uh, the, the parts of the story around the founding of Payne uh, College. Uh, because you know, I know a lot about the history of Miles because of my association with Miles, but just his determination that we are going to have a school and him willing to go and have these co very difficult conversations with people saying, won't you help us? Won't you you know, give to this? And, and just that boldness that he had yeah. really inspired me. So I did not read all the addresses. Uh, I The ones... I kind of glanced at the scholarship and the level of scholarship also uh, helped me to realize now I got to pull some scholarly uh, things into this so it doesn't sound like I'm just talking off the top of my head. <laughs> and so I found uh, <laughs> some of my greater resources, at least for me, were those who have done research into religion, like the Barner Group. And, yeah, the um, Barner. Mm -hmm done research into you know kind of the cultural landscape in which the church exists right, right. because i think as we embrace next and that, that's the second part of the the quadrennial thing as, as we um uh, embrace next we have to have i think a keen awareness of where where society's heading and where people are heading uh particularly around this technology piece uh, I can remember saying to my grandson a few years ago, he was talking about a report that he had, and I can remember asking him about the library, and he said, Grammy, we do our research on the internet. Of course. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, duh. And, you know, increasingly, uh, the, the tool of technology is becoming a primary delivery method of information uh, and the way in which people engage with the world. And while I just heard someone say this the other day, while the method, while the message and the mission of the church doesn't change, mm -hmm. the method of the church, you know, has to uh, speak to the reality of the situation around us. So doing some research and, and reading some things that people were saying. And of course, at the time that I was writing, people were just starting to write about the post pandemic church. Right. And um, I think that's, that's a, still a task before us as we embrace next we've got to uh, really delve into and think about how the pandemic has changed us so that we are ready to embrace what's next for example uh virtual church is not going to go away people are still going to have the expectation and the desire to be able to participate in worship virtually yes but we hold a really high value on in-person participation as a way of demonstrating you're part of the body of Christ and as a way of offering yourself for service, you know, to serve the church and, and to, to demonstrate and to be kind of the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, mm -hmm. which is hard to do virtually. So we've got to wrestle with, you know, what that means, because next is going to involve virtual this whole notion of virtual reality. Yeah. So what does that mean for the church? Very much so. Yeah. Uh, what was the most challenging part of this process? What did you you really wrestle with in terms of having to include um, in, in the ecumenical address something that may not have been necessarily totally favorable uh, about the church, but it was necessary that you address some critical issues in the uh, ecumenical address? Well, I, I think uh, when you put the question that way, I think the biggest struggle was the recommendations that should come. Obviously, the bishops have been working on, um, you know, and identifying several issues over the course of, you know, the whole quadrennium. We had the strategic plan uh, that we were working on. <clears throat> And I felt it was important to weave in those key points of the strategic plan, which are uh, our discipleship initiative, our uh, emphasis on sustainable missions, um, uh, stewardship, let's see, outreach, congregational ministries, and vibrant church. So I felt like it was really important to weave those in. And I didn't want to do that artificially, like just tack them on at the end. And so that became kind of like that see new 
What is it that we have not been doing that we really need to put our energy and our efforts behind? And so uh, how to weave that in with the previous uh, two sections was, I don't want to say it was a challenge, but it was something that I had to do very, very intentionally. And um, beyond that, the I think for me, the biggest risk that I felt that I took was, was the recommendation around itineracy. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. let's talk You're, about that for a minute, Bishop. Well, I think if we're going to face now, embrace next, and see new, things that have been sacred to us and a part of our tradition also have to be reexamined. Yeah. I think the concept of itineracy is a good concept. It, it provides a way for the church to share the gifts of the clergy throughout the region or the district or even the connection. It gives a, a, a minister like me a greater sense of uh, I belong to the body and mm -hmm. the body is not just this local church where I am. And I may be called to serve the body elsewhere. And I, I, I really believe in that. But itineracy in 2022 is different than itineracy. When was. Bishop Lucius Hosey was. Absolutely. Yeah. The world is bigger. Things have changed. And as a bishop, one of the most difficult tasks was making pastoral assignments. Mm -hmm. And part of that had to do for me with recognizing the reality of the life of the pastor. Uh, to move a pastor from one place to another, while it would be a good move in terms of uh, them utilizing their ministry gifts, I always felt compelled to acknowledge that the impact of that, both on the congregation being left and the con receiving congregation, that was a reality, but also the re impact on the pastor's family. It's just hard to pick up and move from one place to another in 2022 when most of our pastors are bivocational. Yeah. So they, they depend on other income to survive. Uh, many of them uh, have their health benefits through those other jobs or through the spouse's jobs. And so when you move a pastor in the name of the itineracy, you're disrupting at least three systems that family system, that receiving church system, and, and the church where the person is leaving. Mm -hmm. I mean, those kinds of disruptions, we have to pay attention to if we want to build on and grow the church. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't grow something by chopping it completely down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to tend to the roots of it, the, the leaves that have already been there, and figure out how to cultivate it so that it grows right. and, and doesn't, you know, uh, uh, regress. And so I think that this part of seeing new is us reimagining how we, not necessarily how we define, but how we utilize the itineracy so that it is not experienced or perceived as such a disruption. Obviously change is gonna disrupt. But uh, it, it breaks my heart when people kind of jokingly refer to um, annual conference season as the CME draft. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I get the humor in that. Yeah. But it's also heartbreaking that we would see such an important part of the life of the church in a way that that we communicate that, you know, we feel like, you know, it's about something that it's not supposed to be about right, right you know when 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 the drafts in sports are happening each team's trying to get the best people sure <laughs> and it's competitive and you know and it comes with a huge salary as well uh, no, absolutely <laughs> and there's a lot of negotiating behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah. not that that shouldn't happen in the church but but we should be able to see the itinerancy as something that adds to yeah uh, who we are as a church so so i including that in one version, just before the final version, I actually took that recommendation out 
And you did. I did. I said, oh, no, I don't think I'll say that. And then it was like, yes, I have to be bold. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know whether you could it. hear, but this recommendation in the area where I was sitting received thunderous applause mm. and support, primarily mm. from preachers, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to be easy task because it is such a embedded part of our life together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's I think it's uh, will be energy well spent in us, you know, telling ourselves the truth about. Mm the positives of how we use our tenoracy and the the downside of how we use our tenoracy. And even if even if we continue to uh you know just assign people one year at a time, what are the best practices in doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, I I there have been times when I've had to make changes at the annual conference because of things that emerge. And you know <laughs> I I never had the experience of being at an annual conference and then, you know, the night before appointments are read or the morning before appointments are read, the bishop comes up and says, oh, guess what? I'm going to move you. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting in this reality of, yeah. oh, what? Huh? Where? What? Huh? You know? And it has happened probably more times than we care to. to and, and, and Yeah. And sometimes sometimes things just happen and you yeah, can't avoid it. Sure. But if we can avoid that kind of you know, shock to people's system. And I also think, uh, and this is my observation as a bishop, I've had some congregations who really struggled to embrace a new pastor uh -huh. because their work, their sense of their work being finished or their affection for the pastor who was leaving was so strong. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, you know, that's just human nature. We form attachments and and things. And, you know, when people have, you know, 48 hours or a week to absorb this new reality, it's to me, it's a, it, it duplicates a little bit of the trauma that was inflicted on our ancestors when slaves were just kind of randomly and families separated. Yeah. 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 And there was just no time to grieve or no time to prepare or even sometimes no time to really effectively say goodbye. Right, so, right. Um, that we don't need to duplicate that kind of trauma. Oh. Yeah. Let, let me ask you, Bishop, I want to go back to the college's input in it when you present it. Um, are there any, and you don't have to call name, any vocal critics, you know, are, are, there, <laughs> there, are there some who m might want to, share more you know thoughts about it or is it just generally received you know uh and that you're on the right track bishop jefferson snorton and 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 keep writing so just kind of take us inside just for a moment of what that process is with the college well when i presented the outline that was the first time i presented the uh, outline uh, like I said, that was about a year before the general conference. You know, I shared with the bishops the struggle I was having uh, with, you know, things just keep changing mm -hmm. and, you know, what's going to be happening by the time, you know, I deliver this. And um, the feedback that I got from the outline was very positive, uh, so much so that I walked away thinking, are they telling me the truth? <laughs> I'm being honest. Do they think this is trash? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're just not saying it because they don't want to hurt my feelings. Right. Uh, what was most effective was uh, once I had kind of the thematic pieces, was engaging with the bishops around who in your Episcopal district is doing this well. Uh, one of the one of the points in terms of uh, I think uh, embracing next had to do with the generational divide mm -hmm. and the way in which we have seen just such a decline in uh, young adult youth and children participation. And, uh, you know, I asked the bishops to who in your Episcopal district is doing this well. And the ones that had examples said yes. And other bishops says that's a big issue in our mm -hmm. district, which for me was an affirmation that that I was kind of on the right track by including this in the address. But it was also good to have 
uh, real live examples uh, from the presiding bishops about who was who was doing a good good job with children's ministry, who was doing a good job with technology, because uh, that was another thing that I talked about. So having those real life uh, examples was was very helpful, and for me, uh, the real value that came from from the bishops. Um, there were a few who sent me some comments uh, <laughs> via email, verbally, or recommendations, and uh, I found that that helpful as well. Good. Did 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 your husband get a chance to interject? <laughs> <laughs> uh, his thoughts was he one of your readers or uh, or what? <laughs> well, you know, not well. Let's see. It it was fairly late in the game before. The game. Yeah. You know, I would bounce things off of him. Like right. for example, I was um, thinking about. Uh, the scriptures to include and mm -hmm. i can remember us having me having one conversation very casually with him about when you hear this scripture does it does it seem like um this scripture has relevance for where the church is in the moment mm -hmm. uh interesting you know during that time period my husband was also presiding elder mm -hmm. and we worked very hard in our relationship <laughs> at that point and even now uh, I'm not his bishop anymore, but you know, to kind of, you know, when are we church talking church and when are we talking family? family yeah. I think for me, uh, his greatest support was uh, just encouraging me when I would, when I feel like, oh, I can't write. I don't feel like it. You know, he would just encourage me and say, you know, just write what you think and then edit it later or, yeah. or uh, you know, step away from it for a minute and, go do something else and you know that kind of encouragement was was really helpful but he did uh suffer through the reading of the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> before i delivered it yeah. uh, because i i just needed to read the whole thing out loud um i think it, i think that was just before i turned it over to dr lewis for publication right, right. and and uh you know that so he he was he was the audience of one that of one yeah. that got the preview for the rest of the general uh -huh. conference yeah. and, I, and, and his feedback to me my my biggest question was does this hang together does yeah. it feel like an address because i didn't want it to be like three separate things right and so yeah so we're a couple of months out from the general conference now maybe three months and and so what have you heard uh, about the e ecumenical address? What has been the talk, you know, since, and um, you know, what things have you, you know, been shared with you? Oh my goodness! Now that has been a big surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have heard through the church just the echoes of this theme, and I've seen uh, seen it uh, expressed in different ways, and. Uh, particularly the notion of bold. I was uh, invited to speak at one uh, presiding elders district conference about the theme and what it meant. And, you know, people were already, it's on their 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 um, worship programs or on their website, uh, web, not websites, uh, Facebook pages and yeah. so forth. And several have taken, and this is one of the things I've been thinking about doing, is uh, offering a challenge. What does B-O-L-D stand for bishop i went to bishop marvin thomas's um annual conference and he has taken that bold and said you know here's here's where we're going to focus on bold i think it's bible outreach leadership and i forget what the d stands for <laughs> but he's taken that whole notion of bold, bold and yeah. created a rubric around which uh his annual conferences will do their yeah. Or, or organize their work. Uh, I was sitting and thinking about that, and and I thought, what does bold mean? What? And um, I came up with um, being open to the leadership of the divine. Be open. Mm. Like that. And, and you know, I I just think the theme offers us all an opportunity wherever we are yeah. to say what does this mean where we are and i've been really pleased uh humbled but just pleased to see how the what what i think god ultimately led 
me to deliver through all these conversations and all these wrestlings and readings that people that that it speaks to where people are now and it ignites a new energy well let's take a look at a few preachers uh who have been bold enough to preach about being bold mm -hmm. word of god for the people of god and we say together thanks be unto god and for your consideration and for the month of september we're going to talk about this subject be bold it's now or never mm. <laughs> be bold it's now or never on june 25th 2022 at the 39th quadrennial session in the 40th general conference in cincinnati ohio the audience stood still as we heard Bishop Teresa Snorton courageously challenge the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. She said, be bold, face now, embrace next, and she knew. And upon my arrival here, Edel Woodford gave me a copy of the Georgia Annual Conference Agenda, the sub theme created by our own Bishop Thomas O'Brown Brother commissioned the 6th Episcopal District. Where might we go from here? I want to talk to you on this first Sunday as we begin our journey. I'm looking for a bold church. Mm. I'm looking for a bold church. I'm looking for those that are bold and, 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 and to be bold. Uh, if you want to be bold, you, you've got to do, you have to do everything for the Lord. The word bold, defined in a Webster dictionary, is someone who is willing to take risks. Mm. Just for a few minutes from the subject, be bold. Don't put things off. Mm. Now, Youth and Young Adults Sunday, I'm not only asking our mature saints to join in, but I'm asking our youth and young adults to listen and join. Well, Bishop, you've given a lot of preachers something to <laughs> preach about. <laughs> Uh, including yours truly. <laughs> I, I took the entire month of September, um, no, of August, uh, and each Sunday I took each part of the ecumenical thing, be bold, face now, embrace nets, and, and see new. And I know so many across the Zion. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me acknowledge that was uh, Reverend Valerie uh, uh, Everett uh, from Westside, Reverend Ferris uh, from Brown Chapel and Reverend Dr. Kathy Jones, uh, who provided um, or whose clips I shared, and I appreciate um, uh, their um, interpretation of the thing. Mm -hmm. And so that is happening. And I think that's what I think from the outcome of the ecumenical address is what we, you wanted, what we wanted, mm -hmm. that people would embrace it mm -hmm. and preach about it so that the congregation you know, could understand what, what the call has been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't tell you how it, it's affirming personally, but it's also affirming in terms of, you know, our collective consciousness as CMEs that, you know, we kind of garner our energies around and it really fits with this uh, part of the strategic plan that's directed around vibrant church, mm -hmm. because um, in so many ways, you know, because we are not going to be able to resurrect what has been even the best of churches, you know, everything was going well, you know, you were having a great worship and great Christian education and great Bible study and great attendance and great finance, <laughs> even if that was your pre-pandemic reality, the pandemic will have shifted something. And we have to not let that become like an Achilles heel for us, but to 
but to see it as a springboard. And I think bold, you know, you got to be bold to jump off that springboard. <laughs> but that's what we're called to do. We're called to see where we are right now and be bold enough to jump off and to, to realize that whatever new is coming, God is there. Yes. One of my favorite quotes that, that comes out of uh, some of the training that I did multiculturally was from an Episcopal bishop who said, you know, when you go into another culture or go into, for me, I can paraphrase it, go into a new experience, take off your shoes because it's holy ground. Mm -hmm. Never forget that God was there before your arrival. And so whatever the new is for us as a church, whatever we have to embrace and shift, we have to remind ourselves and be bold enough to say, God's already there. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to you know, go find God or go drag God into it. God is already there. And that's what, as people of faith, should enable us to take those leaps of faith, to, 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 to try things that we've never done before, to say, you know, it's time to put that to rest. <laughs> Uh, right. because that that tradition or that practice doesn't fit you know our people anymore um you know i i dare say that you know one of the things we're gonna have to wrestle with is this you know magic 11 o'clock worship hour mm -hmm. is, is that you know yeah that's 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 a tradition that was for us to, to some extent related to being uh, enslaved people and we had work to do before we were permitted to go worship. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but is that is that the best time? In some communities, it may be. In other communities, it, it, the reality of people's lives and their travel and how far they are from the church and and the community may necessitate, you know, worship at other times in other forms absolutely oh uh, you know yeah. this this rigidness that we have about uh, i believe in order yes and I don't want anybody to say that that i don't but you know why is it that it has to be the same way every week why is that when really our people uh are struggling, I think, with some real life issues that they need to give voice to and have the opportunity to dialogue about and not just be, you know, I'm a preacher, but we've glorified the pulpit in a way that's not helpful because people, oh, you, don't, wow. you don't live yeah, in the pulpit. Yeah. You don't live in the pulpit. You live in the real world. Yeah. I love a good sermon. I love a good preacher who can deliver the word and, and get my heart to burn in this <laughs> and everything. But at the same time, our folks need to be talking yeah. and and deepening how they use the language of faith in real life. And so I, 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 I agree. I agree with you, Bishop. And um, that 11 o'clock hour uh, has new dynamics. Some churches during the pandemic did worship on su uh, Saturday evening. Mm -hmm. um, we we do worship at 10 o'clock a.m. I mean, it's mm -hmm. an hour before, but it's not that sacred 11 o'clock uh, mm -hmm. hour. But but you you are so right. By the way, uh, that your sermon, uh, Take Off Your Shoes, that you gave at the ITC commencement will go down <laughs> as one of the greatest sermons ever preached, period. Okay. So let me just put that on record, folks who are watching. If you haven't seen it, I think it's on YouTube uh somewhere uh but that was a moment that was an experience uh mm -hmm. unlike anything that i've ever experienced the only thing i was upset with that you didn't preach our my graduation at itc <laughs> uh, but that, that's another conversation but but you're right um and and so as we 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 kind of wrap up with with that uh where where are we with the uh the recommendations and and how long does it take for the recommendations that were adopted to move into um, the next uh, phase, you know, particularly the commission for the uh, status of that itinerant ministry? Has mm -hmm. any movement, are you all discussing that now? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. can you just kind of talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, uh, while we've been here, we have been um, uh, staffing the various commissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been staffing um, 
like for the itinerary, Bishop Heath, Bishop Ken, uh, Bishop Clarence Heath is going to lead the um, Committee on Ministerial Assessment, and that task has been assigned to that Committee on Ministerial Assessment. So he's going to lead that. I, I think I'm his vice chair, I think. Uh, and so we will be leading that group and uh, convening it uh, you know, as schedule permits, but sooner rather than later. Right. But we're staffing all the all the committees and commissions at this meeting and uh, designating the bishops who are the chairs and the vice chairs. And then we spent the entire day yesterday uh, with our strategic plan facilitators talking about uh, launching the various parts of the strategic plan, uh, the parts around um, you know, the vibrant church, the discipleship, and really trying to figure out what's the best way to engage the church. Do we just, you know, say, here's the whole thing, all of the manuals are prepared, uh, or do we kind of choose one emphasis? And I think we didn't finish this conversation, but I think I'm fairly safe to say that uh, as we came to a close yesterday, there was a lot of energy around the Vibrant Church Initiative and really building on that. Uh, I don't know how many people have been participating in the Tuesday night CME grow, grow yes. efforts, but just to really, um, as we resume in-person worship, and as we try to reconfigure the life of the church, that having it be vibrant mm -hmm. and and not just, well, that's what we've always done. Let's do right. that again. Right. But what, what's going to give us the vibrancy and the vitality? Mm -hmm. And the word that, that has become really predominant in our conversation is impact. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the time we end our meeting this week, we will be clear about how the bishops will be going back into their Episcopal districts and leading the church uh, through the presiding elders districts and through the pastors in engaging the strategic plan and, uh, and, and those recommendations of the plan. And I think to demonstrate that we are really serious about this is uh, our facilitators really pressed us on collecting data. Data, yeah. Are you having an impact? Don't just let it be anecdotal. Mm. Uh, you know, you know how we love to tell we stories. Love, we love, we love the oral narrative tradition. Yeah. But can we say, you know, when, for example, when we launched the discipleship initiative, that's something that I work with Dr. Crutchfield on uh, in its formation. Uh, our goal is to have 100% uh, of our churches to use and have the 10 week discipleship uh, curriculum by the end of the quadrennium. Mm -hmm. We want 100% of our churches to take 10 weeks to study the meaning of discipleship. Now, just imagine if that happens, how that's going to at least shift our consciousness. And um, you know, when our consciousness shifts, our actions and our behaviors shift. Mm -hmm. So if we can you know, reclaim this way of thinking of I'm not just a member of the church, I'm a disciple yeah. of Jesus. Uh, so in order to know if 100% of our churches did it, we got to collect some data Yeah, every year. So we, did. so we talked yesterday about you know some means to do that so that it doesn't become, collecting the data doesn't become the task. Right. <laughs> the, the task is to like get putting your pastoral reports together at the right, end. Right, right. You know. Whether it's true or not, true or whether not. it has <laughs> impact or not. So we, so we talked, for example, about the difference between, you know, we could just count the number of people that order the materials and say, oh, that's our data. But yeah. that doesn't tell us anything about who used it. And what difference it made in the church right and so we really want to uh use this time to um i guess i want to say up our game in yeah. terms of our own expectations of ourselves right uh not just kind of say throw it out there and use it and then never hold us ourselves accountable yeah for the things that we said are important yeah. and we must do so uh, I would encourage everybody, I understand there's an article coming out in the next issue of the index written okay. by Senior Bishop Reddick about the strategic plan and okay. those recommendations. Uh, I guess that would probably be the October issue. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the, the, it's already been submitted. And uh, we just need to continue to encourage ourselves to avail ourselves to the resources that we're trying to produce. And uh, I know through my other work uh, around program development, we are working really hard on some initiatives to actually create uh, some original material. Mm -hmm. uh, not that other people's material isn't adequate, but we want to produce original material that evolves out of our own um, experts within our congregations that we can use for things like uh, with, with one of the initiatives we're talking about is with children okay. and creating vibrant children's church. And rather than having to go to somebody else's materials, create some things right of our own, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that represent who we are and who we are trying to be as a church together but also accomplishes the task of nurturing and formation and spiritual development with children. So oh. I think there's going to be a lot happening. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think uh, staying energized in the midst of a society that just distracts us in so many ways is a big challenge. But, uh, you know, if we remind ourselves that, that we are the church that God is, desires to have right. then we can find the energy even when we gotta find ourselves depleted to get re-energized and keep keep going well i think we are excited with you we're excited for you uh and the work that you will be doing as the ecumenical bishop and also in and looking at opportunities grants and fundings you and i've had conversations uh, about some some opportunities so we are excited so my last question to you because i know you have to, to leave so what is it like to have another sister on the bench bishop <laughs> <laughs> well that's been wonderful it's been just uh, so refreshing um, <laughs> and um it, interesting enough uh bishop anders modis and i uh go way back when we yeah. were both young adults in the uh early 90s in, and we were both living in Richmond. We were part of the young adult group at Broomfield CME Church in oh, Richmond. Wow. Okay. So we've had a had a long relationship yeah. and have known each other for a long time. Uh, she was not in ministry at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I was not bishop at that point. So we've known each other um, as sisters in Christ. Yes. And, uh, spent a lot, our young adult group back then was very, very active and we spent a lot of time together. Uh, but in terms of her being on the bench and she's the presiding bishop of my home district, yeah, the second Episcopal that's district. That's right. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened a couple of days ago was us actually as bishops having some conversation about issues of sexism mm. and, and uh, how um, easily it is embedded in our traditions and in our you know ways of thinking and ways of talking and then we talked about just you know it wasn't an extensive conversation about you know now that the the college you know is more diverse and the important mm -hmm. diversity um bishop uh agile and his presence as an international you know we've had bishop umoite but you know these the the ways in which the presence of someone other than males is being right. uh, lived out in our church is so important. So it's been good to have her. We we've, we've you know how you know how you do sometimes we kind of caught each other's eye and chuckle uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times. Right. But having another female who has a similar perspective on things mm -hmm. as I, um, I think is helpful. You know, we're we're different individuals. We have sure. different stories and different histories but uh, i think the church is better off yeah. that our college of bishops our key leadership is more diverse and by having another woman and by continuing to have an, uh, a person who represents the international membership well bishop teresa jefferson snort and thank you so much for the generosity uh, of your time uh and for allowing us to uh delve in with you on how you put together this uh, magnificent uh ecumenical 
uh, report ecumenical address uh, that is really shaping the direction of our church for this next quadrennium. So thank you. God bless you. And uh, continue to have a great rest of the College of Bishops meeting uh, until we, we meet again. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to reflect on, on the whole process of, of the address and thank look you. forward to working with you in the future. I look forward to it too as well, Bishop. Thank you. A race to distribute water in Jackson, Mississippi. Cars lined up for miles outside distribution centers full of locals hoping for water who left empty handed after the supply quickly ran out. The water that they are giving, well, you can't get to because the line be so damn long. For weeks, Jackson residents have been under a boil water notice put in place last month because of contaminated water concerns. Now they're on the brink of having no water at all. The uh, water pressure has been low. So Tapris Young has been spending $100 a week on water for her family. We've had to boil water to cook, to wash dishes, you know, pretty much to brush our teeth. State officials say flood water complications impacted storage tanks, pumps, and water flow, resulting in a failure at Jackson's main plant. The lack of water was due to pressure, a lack of pressure in the system. The water is not safe to drink, and I would even say it's not safe to brush your teeth with. Today, the governor declaring a new state of emergency, announcing a total or near total loss of water pressure throughout the city and surrounding areas. The city cannot produce enough water to fight fires, to reliably flush toilets, and to meet other critical needs. The state now preparing for the colossal challenge of distributing water to 180,000 people in and around Jackson. How long can the city operate without running water, distributing water the way you're planning to do? I mean, this isn't sustainable. We're going to go with this emergency plan as long as we have to. The governor telling me tonight he does anticipate improvement in the coming days with more help arriving at the plant and to distribute the water, but with rain returning today, new concerns of more possible flooding. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking. This afternoon, I am joined by uh, a God sent team uh, of preachers and a bishop who have responded to the water crisis uh, in Jackson. Let me present to you Bishop Kenneth Carter, the presiding prelate of the 4th Episcopal District. We have Reverend Dr. Jamie Capers, who is the pastor uh, of the Lynch Street uh, CME uh, Church. We have Reverend Dr. Jeff Lofton, the presiding elder and pastor of Little Bethel uh, and coordinator of the Water Project for Jackson. Uh, we also are joined by uh, Reverend uh, Danny Willis, who is the pastor of Washington Temple uh, in Jackson as well. Uh, good afternoon, my brothers. Thank you so much for uh, taking a few minutes uh, out of your time to kind of give us an update uh, of what's going on and your response uh, and the church's response to uh, the water crisis in Jackson. Bishop Carter, I'd like to start with you. Uh, would you just sort of just tell us uh, your thoughts about uh, what the preachers have done and what you have been doing uh, since the water crisis began. Thank you, Dr. Skip. And thank you for this opportunity to share our ministry and mission. I was in Cairo, Egypt, meeting with my uh, team there in Cairo, in, in Egypt. And each night on CNN, we was I was uh, enlightened by the story of the water crisis in Jackson. And from that point, I had an opportunity to call together my A-team, Presiding Elder Jeff Lofton and Presiding Elder Pastor Capers for us to put together a plan that, that we could be a source of inspiration and help to those who need clean water. And from that point, my A team went to bat and formulated a, a plan that was excellent, even in the midst of their leader. And I want to say thank you to my whole team, Reverend Willis, Reverend Powell, and all of the uh, presiding elders and pastors and ministers of the fourth district 
But most of all, I want to thank the CME Church. This was one time I really felt great, felt happy to be a CME because all across the world, even in Egypt, people wanted to donate water and supplies to this project that we were involved in. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Presiding Elder and Pastor Capers, tell us a little bit about uh, the work uh, that has been going on uh, at Lynch Street and, and under uh, your leadership uh, as well. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Skip, as Bishop said, for this uh, opportunity uh, to share uh, the work, the ministry that has been going on uh, over the past uh, three weeks. Uh, we've been, of course, receiving uh, water as well as uh, donations from uh, around the country uh, within the CME Church and other uh, companies and uh, ministries. Um, and uh, over the past uh, three weeks, uh, we've been, uh, of course, uh, distributing water uh, in the community. Uh, to those who are homebound. Um, and when trucks uh, were coming in, uh, there were people who were driving by and saw the trucks and wanted some water at, at that time. So uh, we were, uh, we've been passing out water um, and then we had the uh, great um, uh, distribution on uh, September the uh, 17th with the uh, help of the entire Fourth uh, Episcopal District um, and so it's been um, a, a blessing. It has, I believe, uh, brought um, a sense of, of joy and a sense of uh, belonging to the citizens of Jackson, uh, knowing that, you know, the uh, CME Church, uh, more specifically, uh, cares about them um, and uh, wanted to uh, do something to help them uh, during this um, difficult time. Uh, I believe uh, in total, you know, well over uh, 3,000 cases of water uh, have been distributed over the past three weeks, along with uh, cleaning supplies and other supplies that are of hygiene nature and are uh, necessary uh, for survival. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Presiding Elder Lofton, uh, what, what has this project meant to you? Uh, the people that you serve, uh, the community uh, that you are a part of, uh, and as it has been indicated by uh, Presiding Elder Capers and Bishop Carter, the response uh, of our church and the community to it. What has this meant to you? It, it has been an inspiration to me to for us to do ministry beyond the walls mm -hmm. of our churches and the call went forth to all of the churches um, to make water available for distribution. And the churches went to work doing that very thing. And we pulled together as a team of presiding elders and pastors and selected areas there in Jackson where that's, that was affected the most from this crisis and made sure that the uh, churches had available personnel to work to distribute the water. And uh, I know two days um, I've worked to help unload um, two 18 wheelers of water. Uh, but uh, the call went out and the people uh, went to work and, 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 made a difference in the life of the people there in Jackson and in the surrounding communities. Um, uh, people from Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, even overseas, um, we were able to get uh, water uh, donations uh, to make this become a reality. Uh, as the bishop called upon us, we made it a point to do what was asked and it's been a joy as well as an inspiration uh, to me to be part of this uh, water uh, distribution. Uh, my head forklift driver who was Johnny on the money, 
uh, driving a fork. Um, I knew how to uh, operate a pallet jack a little bit, but I got a good lesson in uh, operation. And uh, now I can uh, be proud of the work that uh, the people uh, this community has done on our behalf and for the residents um, there in Jackson. That that is that is tremendous. Uh, I mean, we've seen the pictures and and and, and video, but the outpour of support has just been uh, tremendous. Uh, uh, Reverend Willis, uh, same question uh, for you: the impact of your community uh, and the fact that the church stepped up to to respond. Tell us what you've seen uh, and your thoughts about what has taken place as well. Uh, also, Dr. Skip, I want to say. Um, a good morning, an opportunity for to uh, speak with you. Uh, to God be the glory. Uh, for the community, it, it was an opportunity to see uh, the CME Church uh, brought again to the forefront of uh, doing the work. I think, like Dr. Lawton um, said, that uh, it, it was an opportunity to serve outside the walls. And for to see the connectional part of uh, the CME Church come together from, from our uh, bishop, uh, the elders, all the way down to the local level, and for the members in the community to see that the CME Churches are, are here alive and well in the city of Jackson. I, I, um, I, I you know, kind of echo uh, Bishop, uh, proud to be CME. And most of all, uh, to see that we are connectional, we, are, we, we come together and the forces of our, our coming together uh, to uh, making an a impact on uh, a concern in the city of Jackson that's been going on for quite a long time. And I think it's the season for um, the CME Church and um, leaders and members to uh, get back into the community, especially into the city of Jackson, and, and you know, let them know that we are here, and uh, we are doing the work. We are doing the work of ministry. I, I, I found it to be um, inspirational to me uh, for to go on and go into the local church uh, the Sunday after uh, the water distribution to go in and then have a new focus uh, before the people to know that our church and for them to see that our churches come together in a, in a time of a crisis. Thank you. Uh, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm just moved uh, by, by your leadership um, and, you know, really being a shining example of what the church is. We learned through the pandemic that much of what we should be doing is outside of the building, uh, outside of the sanctuary. Uh, and you have demonstrated. So what's next for for uh, Jackson? Has the water condition uh, improved? Uh, are you continuing to receive items, financial contributions? What is the plan of action and, and how can the church continue to help? Well, uh, thank you for that question. I, and and, and uh, Dr. Skip, I think the, the next focus should be that this um, uh, crisis has been decades in the making. And what happened, you know, with the uh, political leadership within the city and actually in our state, they have taken the funds away from the city of Jackson and then allowed it to uh, fall into a disarray and chaos. And I think our focus from a church standpoint and, and the community as well for to get in and, and, and uh, not attack the current leaders as if they're at fault. It's been a long time coming. And certainly to, to uh, go in and, and deal with the economics, the, the economics of what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, when, when it all gets said and done, they have, we have allowed for uh, the funds to be put in the peripheral of Jackson, right outside of Jackson at each border of the city. We have uh, infrastructure uh, that's not quite like Jackson. We have uh, 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 all of the monies, uh, federal and state monies, right outside the city of Jackson, and they're choking the city away from those funds and the opportunity for the community to grow and do what needs to be done. So I think the focus should be for us to not go away from the economic arm of all of this. It's good mm -hmm. for goodwill, 
for the churches to come together, but also not to take our eyes off of the funds, off of the money. Do not miss the economic piece. And if we stay along with uh, taking care of the concerns of, uh, of the water and the people, to 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 uh, educate our people mm -hmm. about um, uh, uh, city government, about state government, about government as well, because right. we, we we're paying in, but we're not getting the return on the monies that we're paying into the state through our taxes and uh, through our economics. And, and that's one of the questions that I wanted to put, and we welcome uh, Reverend Powell as well. Glad to to have her. Uh, what what becomes advocacy, Dr. Capers, Dr. Lofton, um, in terms of you're serving the people now and meeting some temporary needs, but then what becomes your advocacy working with city leaders and community leaders to, to further move this? And then I'm a, I have a comment from uh, Reverend Powell and then Bishop Carter. I'll, I'll ask you to close us out with some thoughts. You know what? What? What becomes your next step in terms of advocacy for for the people? On and I know we're not politicians, but certainly preachers have always been in the forefront. Uh, Doctor Capers, Doctor Lofton, would you all just just give me your quick thoughts on that, please? Well, through the pastors together uh, going to the officials in charge i think that we could work with them and help them to understand more fully um what it is that we need to do as a community to help meet the needs of the people so we we still are not going to stand outside this situation and not be involved in it to the point that um, uh, uh, we don't address them to see what can uh, be done. Um, and a lot of that uh, is being done, will be done uh, from the church's standpoint, the Bethel standpoint, from representatives that are in that particular church and um, in uh, Dr. Capers' church uh, we will be working with those particular individuals uh, to help us further address the issues um, to the officials uh, there in Jackson, Mississippi. Dr. Capers, you, you, you've only been in Jackson for, what, a few months now. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you jump right into the frying, the, the proverbial frying pan of, of uh, community outreach. But you know, advocacy is so much a part of what we do. Uh, do you share with uh, presiding elder Lofton that you know you have to continue to work with the city leaders? Oh yes, most most definitely. Um, I think the church pastors uh, play an integral integral role um, in um, building that uh, you know relationship between the community uh, and the political leaders. Uh, you know, I'm still in the process of building relationships um, with city council uh, members, uh, state representatives, as well as state senator, um, and also uh, working to uh, partner with uh, an organization called uh, Working Together uh, Jackson. Um, and so one of the things uh, that, that has to be the focus, I think, is also uh, empowering the people in the community, the citizens of Jackson. Uh, to help them understand that they too have a, a great and a strong voice. And so um, as we go forth and, and, and speak with, converse with uh, those in power um, alongside us should be those citizens of Jackson who have a, um, a say in the fight, who are being impacted by the, the issues uh, such as the water crisis. And so um, we have to be, as Dr. Lofton said, at the forefront of the issues that are before us in our community. Thank you. Reverend Powell, welcome. Pastor of uh, Lane Chapel. Uh, so delighted to have you with us uh, today. Uh, and just, just tell us quickly about the work that you've done 
uh, for your community and addressing the needs as it relates to this water crisis? Well, we were privileged and honored and blessed uh, to have water delivered along with paper items, paper products and cleaning items. A lot of people in my community uh, experienced flooding and even some of them, the pipes had burst under their homes, which means they had no water at all to clean with or to do anything with. And so that blessing came along and we were able to deliver water uh, to uh, senior citizens' apartments, uh, 196 cases of water, as and we also served 300 people with uh, water. Um, the area that I uh, am the shepherd over uh, is is uh, is really a drug and crime ridden area. So now I'm trying to work with JPD along as as well as the city council members and state representatives to get some help over there. We have many senior citizens who are in those homes who don't come out, who are afraid to come out and who are there. So our main effort is to go in and service them uh, and to provide something positive in that community, like uh, May Save a Soul Fest, where we bring the, um, the leaders of the city out to address them in their area, not somewhere else in a park, but exactly where they live. And so there's a lot of blight in the community, uh, a lot of homes that have been burned out, and hopefully we can acquire some of those properties in order to secure the uh, church because there has been crime there. Uh, I've had four separate break-ins in one month where even the, the security doors were stolen. How do you walk through a community with two large storm doors? So we have to engage the community, get them involved, love them, and draw them to Christ. And it takes uh, teamwork to uh, do that. So hopefully we will have that teamwork among our churches and other churches in the area. Wow, that's fantastic. That is great. Well, Bishop, uh, Carter, I know that you are proud of your, your preachers and pastors, but I also know you having served under you for uh, eight years. It, it seemed like it was a, a, a hundred years, but it was just eight years serving under you. I, I know what you expect of your preachers and pastors, you know, so not necessarily pats on the back, but this is what they're supposed to be doing. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And so close us out, Bishop, and just give us your final closing thoughts about the work um, that these preachers are doing and, and going forward. Uh, and the fact that if members send money to the relief fund, that that money is going to be used for exactly what it has been designated for. Thank you again. Dr. Skip Mason for this opportunity to share our Beyond the Walls ministry concept for the 4th Episcopal District. Two quick things I'd like to share that really got me excited about this mission. Number one is I had an opportunity to model with the 4th Episcopal District our missions outreach for the church. And it was so exciting that members of the fourth district have asked, when can we do this uh, with you in Egypt and Sudan and South Sudan? So the appetite has been good and I'm excited about that. But I'm most excited about during the time that I was sharing this information um, with my team, my leadership team in Egypt, uh, I shared with them that we had $6,000 left from our big campaign and our project in Sudan. And I said to the two contractors, since we did not pay you, I want to share this with you. And they immediately said to me, no, Bishop, don't do that. We are part of the fourth and we want you to take that money and buy water that our brothers and sisters in America can have fresh water to drink. And that really just blew my mind. And I'm grateful that God is moving in a miraculous way. Thank you for this opportunity to share our mission and our ministry 
with the world. Thank you, Bishop Carter and the preachers of the 4th Episcopal District. Thank you, Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton. And thank all of you for tuning in for another conversation with Dr. Skip Mason. Don't forget the CIT Tech Talk comes up at seven o'clock and a preview of the new website will take place. I close out with this clip from the upcoming PBS special, The Making of Black America. I look forward to seeing you for another conversation next month. Go in love and go in peace and go with the joy of Jesus in your heart. Are there things that you can only say to another black person that you would never to one of your white colleagues? Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much richness to black life and black culture that happens out of the view of white people. African Americans who were excluded from the larger American society, so they replicated the world from which they were excluded by building their own cultural and social networks. Professor Gates had the idea to talk about Black joy, to talk about some of the magic of Black networks and organizations. I was like, of course. For African Americans living in a society that wasn't designed for them, having spaces where they could talk freely with people who understood their experiences was liberating. The expression of who we were culturally, the Afro, going back to our roots, became very important to express the beauty of blackness. Black is beautiful! Hey, yo. What does black joy mean to you? Black joy means being in a safe space and feeling free. It's these spaces that we created that allowed us to fight, allowed us to persevere. The existence of these networks shows that black people were optimistic because they said, we're going to nurture our own selves. We're going to thrive, and you got to admire that. Black is beautiful.